It's such a joy to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be at Life Point. Uh, and I'm looking forward to also visiting Life Point Yaba very soon. Yeah. I, I want um, I want to quickly put some things on the table. Uh, what you guys call shaking the table. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I will try to see if I can break one or two. But the idea is actually just to shake it and not break it. Yeah. I'll say two or three things and then we can go into this conversation. One is that in every generation, God has projects. Projects. There are generational projects and there are generational voices. And there are things that are exclusive preserves of a generation. So there are generations of people who built America, for instance. If you haven't seen the video before, get on YouTube and Google or check the men who built America. So the likes of John D. Rockefeller, um, you know, the guy who started is a start oil that became maybe Chevron or Mobile and all that. Um, the guy, um, um, people like Henry Ford, yeah, who pioneered the uh, automobile motor engine. You know, Henry Ford only just came to a realization that people needed something that they could not describe. The best way they could describe it was a faster horse. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they didn't know that there was something. That's where the horsepower thing came from. You know, uh, motor engine today is still rated in horsepower. Yeah. You can imagine a life where on the, on the, the roads were narrow and it was only horses and you know, chariots that they were pushing. And somebody was unreasonable enough to think that people needed something they could not describe. And he started to work on it. Uh, so there are generational projects. Those are projects for that generation. And in every generation, people will come to that point of either fear or apathy, where they think, for instance, oh, if you power the cart with an engine, how are you going to control it like you could control the horse? Yeah. And the horse may even get weary and slow down by itself when it's hungry or thirsty. But this one, how's it going to happen? If it goes at a certain speed, would it, the human heart still be able to breathe again or beat again? <laughs> you know, there are many fears and apprehensions. Same thing with the Wright brothers. Ogivi and Weber Wright. The guys who invented the aircraft. One of the uh, issues with them also was, was man really created to fly? I don't know if you've read their story before, but their, their father happened to be a, like a minister, a church minister. A bishop was visiting their city. Those boys were still small boys then. The father was having a conversation with a visiting bishop, and they came to a conclusion together as spiritual people that man was not created to fly. Only angels are created to fly. Meanwhile, in the humor of God, the kids that would create the aircraft, they were sitting on the floor, listening to the conversation, and they could not even make sense of what they were saying. But God already coded it into their spirit that they are of the generation of people that will create engines that will fly in the sky. Earlier this year, in the month of March, after some long trips, I was at a hotel. I mean, a church in Toronto meets somewhere close to Toronto Airport. That's in Mississauga, Ontario, Elevate Community Church. And they put me in this hotel that was overlooking the airport. So I could see the tarmac and the wrong way. I woke up in the morning and opened the window and I saw aircrafts, you know, just across the road. And I remember that I'd been flying then for like two weeks. I flew from Lagos to South Africa, Cape Town. From Cape Town, the longest um, flight that I'd ever taken was from Cape Town to San Francisco. 16 hours stretch. March this year. From San Francisco 
to Buffalo, New York, to Toronto, to Halifax, to, you know, then I went back to Toronto. And I was thinking about it. In the days of the Apostle Paul as a missionary, if he wanted to cover and transverse from West to, to South Africa, and then from there to San Francisco Bay Area, and then from there to Canada, it would have taken Apostle Paul like two years. Yeah. And all that within two weeks. All thanks to Weber and, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> and Ogilvy Wright and them living up to their generational projects and fulfilling it. I can go on and on and on. All I'm saying is there are generational projects that are generational voices. And God wants your voice to be heard in your generation that you may participate in generational projects that God has a mark for a generation. Uh, we're in the generation of AI and all those, you know, machine learning and um, um, uh, what do you call it? The, the currency part of it. What do you call that? Crypto, not, not just crypto, the blockchain technology, you know, and all that. And before the end of this decade, many more things will still come up. At the beginning of this decade, AI was not popular. We're just three years into the decade. We're talking about AI and it's becoming prominent. It will, some things will come as offshoots of it. In the social sector, it's the same. A generation that needs to conquer the overwhelming feeling of hopelessness, hopelessness and, over, and overcome mental health issues and come up with the spirit of Caleb and Joshua in Numbers 13 verse 30, where Caleb quieted the people and said, we are well able to possess the land. He said, let no man's heart be dismayed or troubled because of the giants. We're in a generation where many people's hearts are troubled and dismayed. And one little thing can stop you right in your track from wanting to try and push the boundary. But with a pioneering grace, with audacity and courage, you can break boundaries and step across the divide because that's the spirit of Christ. Yeah. Jews were not known to relate with Gentiles. Jesus was at the well, you know, and he met the woman. The woman at the well, I think John chapter 4 or so. And Jesus started to talk to the woman. And the woman even challenged Jesus. How, how, how come you, being a Jew, you're asking me, being a Samaritan water. And the woman started to say, no, this is not supposed to. And Jesus said, a time is coming. A time is coming. <laughs> because the woman said, uh, Jesus was talking, I mean, he started talking about worship. He said, our fathers, you know, worship in, on this mountain, uh, you know, and all that. He said, Jesus said, a time is coming. We're true worshipers. That you won't have to go to any mountain. You will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. There were changes that Christ came to institute for that generation to break the divide between the Jews and the Gentiles, the Samaritans, you know, and all that. All kinds of things are happening. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, you read about the story of Peter in his own generation. Christ had gone. The breaking of the divide has to continue. The gospel has to go beyond the Jewish community into the Gentiles. And there was a man there, Cornelius by name, was a great guy. He positioned to be a specimen for what God wanted to start. And the Bible says his hands giving and his devotion and all that had come to God as a memorial. And God remembered Cornelius but that there's a need for someone with a pioneering spirit, with a generational voice that will break the divide and go to the house of Cornelius. Peter, however, in I think verse 13 or 14, in Acts chapter 10, was... Uh, uh, was fasting, also positioning himself in fasting. <laughs> and the Bible says about midday, the sixth hour, you know that midday fast, when you get to 12 1, when you start to see double. You know, it's easy to fast at 9 a.m., <laughs> but you wait till 12. <laughs> Peter was around that 12 1. And Bible says he saw uh, um, a trance. He fell into a trance. And God started to speak to him through the picture that he was seeing. 
he saw all kinds of four-footed beasts. All the animals described in the book of Leviticus that the Jewish people must not eat. God was showing Peter. Yeah. There's something you need to do differently in your generation. You know, deal with your fear. Deal with your shame. Because Peter was wondering, how come me being a Torah bred Jewish person, I will now be eating all these things. And a voice came to him, Peter, arise, kill and eat. Peter said, no, I can't eat. I've never eaten anything that is unclean or common. And God said, it happened three times. He said, what I've called clean, don't call unclean. Yeah. There are things the other generation called unclean that God has cleansed for this generation. <laughs> I mean, for instance, it's, it's, it should be unclean for you to be worshipping in darkness. <laughs> but in your generation, it is clean. Yeah. In my generation, it's unclean for you to have multiple perforation. Yeah. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. It has been cleansed for your generation. Yeah, in my generation, it's unclean. For is it Josh? Uh, and lucky. And lucky. Are you Yeah, both of you come, come here. They are my, they are my sons, my children. So I can play with them. I like to touch their hair. <laughs> See, in my generation, you will be cast out of the synagogue. You will come like this. Or if your, your hair is colored like this, <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be like you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And I hear about your God experience earlier. Wasn't that great? Yes, sir. And that tall man, Ejiro, where is the tall man? Yeah. Ejiro. Yeah. Um, those guys are doing a fantastic job in, in, in their industry, and they're pioneering. The spirit of this house is upon them. Yeah. 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 I saw what they've done with the wives. I watched the first two or three episodes, and um, it was great. Watch out for it. So, what God called unclean for a generation can be cleaned for another generation. There are generational projects, and there are generational voices. Today, I'm charging you to be a voice in your generation. Peter, with boldness and courage, decided to follow the emissaries from the house of Cornelius and walk with them. And when they got to the house of Cornelius, Peter, with trepidation and anxiety, still wondering, what am I doing here? John and James must not find me here. Yeah, because this is the house of a Gentile. So he just decided to just say whatever came to his mind about Jesus. The Bible says, why Peter yet speak, the Holy Ghost fell on the Gentiles. In Peter's account, when he went back to the apostles, he told them, I didn't do anything. I just showed up while I was yet speaking. He said, even me, I was surprised that the Holy Spirit can come on Gentiles. God is just looking for somebody to step out and step up. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand something. When you think about pioneering, when you think about, you know, answering the call of God upon your life, when you think about starting something new, when you think about, you know, being bold enough to step into your destiny, please remember this. God will never ask you for what you don't have. He will only ask you for what you have. In every generation, there's a man, there's a woman, whom God will ask, what do you have in your hand? He asked Moses that same question. The call of Moses' generation was a call of liberation, to liberate the generation from slavery. Yeah. The call of Joshua's generation was to divide territories yes, after slavery. Every generation has a project. And there are people that God wants to use. In Moses' generation, is an end to slavery. And when God will bring an end to slavery, the only question he asked Moses is, what do you have in your hand? He said, I have a rod. He said, drop it. And Moses' rod astonished the astrologers and the magicians in Egypt. I don't know whether God has called you to entertainment, into sports, into politics. Your rod will swallow 
the rod of juju people. Yeah. Your rod will swallow the rod of corrupt people. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He only needed to drop his rod. And it just, that, that was it. When, 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 when David was to take shame away and reproach from Israel in, 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 in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 17, it was the same thing. It was just a matter of David woke up one morning. The hand of God was upon his life as a voice for his generation. He didn't even know. His father said, I want to send you on error. You do Uber it today. <laughs> so you take food to your brothers. David said, it's okay. But destiny was calling. Somebody I'm speaking to you today. You may be on a job that you don't like. But please understand, right on that job, there will be destiny signals. You'll be connected with destiny. Amen. You, you know, when David woke up that morning, the last thing he wanted to do was to be distributing food to his brothers that didn't like him. Because even when he showed up, they said, what, what, why are you here? You, you know, prognose, prognose. You just want to see what is going on on this war front, Abby. You, are, you know you are small, you cannot fight, but you still came. Say, ah, daddy says I should just deliver food to you. Or do you people like hunger? <laughs> and then he gave them the, 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 the food and obeyed his father. His father said, look, look for their supervisor. Give him this special package so that my children, my children will not die. We won't put them where they will shoot them. Yeah. And that was his assignment. But while he was doing that, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this and I'll take my seat. While he was doing that, he saw Goliath. The champion of the Philistines. Right there in the valley of Elah. Goliath was roaring. Cursing the God of Israel. And speaking blasphemous words. Something in David rose up. I cannot be here. And you'll be speaking like that. And David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That would defy the Hamis? of the God of Israel. Destiny rose up in David. The pioneering spirit rose up. Even saw a man of war with a glorious armor and all that. His spirit left him when he saw Goliath. Yeah. But when you see someone with pioneering grace, when they confront a typology of Goliath, their question is, you know, their, their own mantra is, it's too big, I can't miss him. Where people say, it's too big, he's going to kill us. No, he said, ah, David said, I have stones now. It's too big, I can't miss him. Yeah. I mean, um, if you see somebody this long, this wide, I've been hearing, uh, you know, birds that are smaller. I won't miss this one. Yeah. And in the same way, God does not ask you for what you don't have. All David needed to bring down Goliath was a sling. He had it on his neck. You know, sling. Yeah. And five small stones that he picked around. Because somebody here, you may see me saying, I don't have capital to start the business. I don't have sponsor. I don't have this. God is always asking you for what you have, but not what you don't have. A rod that you have gotten used to. A sling with which you have killed birds. Yeah. It's still the same sling you used to bring down Goliath. Yeah. Are you still with me today? Yeah. So tell your neighbor, say, stop looking too far. Look within. Look around. Help is not far from you. Yeah. So I want you to understand that it's time to make greatness come on. It's time to push the, the boundaries. It's time to manifest the pioneering spirit. And lastly today, our nation is at a time where hopelessness is pervasive. Especially after the Supreme Court declaration. I need you to understand that whether you fulfill your destiny or not is not premised on who is president. Yeah. It's not premised. God cannot, he does not have tenor. Your God doesn't have tenor. So I'm saying, 
whether you like the president or not, whether you voted for him or not, the Supreme Court now says he's our president. All right? Whatever happens after now, it's not his responsibility, it's your responsibility. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah. How do I mean is that you need to take charge of your own life first and tell yourself, whoever is president of Nigeria, all I know is that the covenant of God is working over my life. As far as I am concerned and my household, we will thrive. We will thrive. And we will still continue to work for the good of Nigeria yeah. and for the prosperity of this land and for the reformation of this land. And we will not allow anything to stop us or dampen our spirit. We carry pioneering grace. We don't stop. It's not over until it's over. And it's not over until we win. God bless you. I feel like we can share the grace and go home. But, um, I have a couple of questions for you, sir. And thank you so much for that wonderful word, sir. Um, so, uh, the first question is, um, you, you kept talking about there are big things that are set for this generation. And for some of us, maybe that reality is just dawning on us that there are some big things. So it would be nice if you could just sort of talk us through some of the things that you are seeing. I remember you giving an example, because I listened to the message, um, the first sermon at um, Elevation, and you were talking about, um, you know, for instance, the prevalence of fibroids in, in West Africa and, you know, in urban cities and all of that. And that might be something for somebody who's in the healthcare sector who's looking and thinking, okay, I didn't know that this was a problem, and it's now something that maybe I can latch on to as something to, to work on. So there's that. I was thinking, are there any specific things that you can see on the horizon that you think these are issues that we need to start to channel our pioneering spirit towards? So that's my first question. And then I think the second question would be, because you, again, you talked about giants. And... <clears throat> For some of us, the giants are some people's daddies in the sense that they are human beings who are actively standing as giants in this promised land that we've been, we've been given. So how do I channel my pioneering spirit towards that and how do I navigate this relationship where I have to sort of overcome these giants in and around my, my space? Okay, let's start with the first one. Um... Every generation has a project, like I said. In the generation of Mary, the project was the physical birthing of the Messiah. Israel waited for that Messiah for many years. Yeah. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah, where he was saying, um, yeah, he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. Google it, you'll see maybe one or two opinions about the distance between that prophecy and the birth of Christ. But definitely, it's not short of a century. Yeah. Isaiah and Jesus, they're not made in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the distance is, is wide. Yeah. Well over 100 years, maybe 150 years. But they kept the record of those prophecies. Yeah. Now, when the prophecy will be fulfilled, it was a generation of Mary. The Bible says that God found Mary faithful and put his favor upon her. The angel came and said, you are highly favored amongst women. God is always doing something. We just need to position. We may not even know it all. Some, you know, we may have an idea. I mean, for instance, as we, as we progress into this uh, um, decade and beyond, Digital technology is going to be the, the main thing. Platforms will be so democratized. You understand? I grew up in this nation in the 70s and 80s where uh, it was the rudimental level of you know, media. You had maybe only one TV station, NTA Ibadan, first in Africa. Yeah, uh, and all that. That was what we watched when we were growing up. And 
But you imagine where things are today. But beyond TV is that a generation had the privilege of being able to carry media on handheld device. You didn't have to get home to watch the news. Mm. I tell you, these things are going to blow out before the end of this decade. Mm. Yeah. And many more things. So we need to get ready to pioneer in that space. I mean, we're in the age of fintech, but we're just scratching the surface of fintech. So if you think that all the fintech uh, innovation that can happen has happened, you're just joking. Yeah. Before the end of this decade, see all this uh, Nara dollar stuff. Innovative ways are going to come around it, and all these middlemen creating problems. If you are making money from selling dollar in black market now, go and look for another job. Yeah. 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 Go and look for another job. Because something is going to happen that we won't need all that system again at all. Yeah. So, uh, whether you call it uh, fintech, whether it's technology for health, you know, agrotech, all kinds of tech. But much more than that, another thing that will blow out is how we relate, you know, how we love, you know, how, how we live, even how we die. Everything is going to change. And you and I have to look for how God will signal us to participate. What is coming ahead is big. It's going to be faster than what we have experienced before. You know, we experience changes maybe every 20 years. But what about if you're experiencing changes every two years? Hmm. Yeah, every two years. And, you know, we were taught globalization when I was in university. But all the curriculum has become obsolete. Because what they were calling globalization then, <laughs> if only they knew what re-globalization will look like. Because in these days of TikTok and Snap, <laughs> the professors that taught me globalization <laughs> in Unilag when I was studying uh, uh, international law and diplomacy, well, they are all probably dead now. <laughs> because what we're teaching us then has become so obsolete. Yeah. A, a, a 16-year-old in Lagos speaks the same language with a 16-year-old in Singapore mm. and in Sydney, Australia. Because it's a TikTok language, it's a snap language. Yeah. So if you, if you push the ticket a little further, it, it can just give you an idea of what is ahead of us. The big question is, how are you positioning yourself? to be able to pick the signals that will show you where you should participate. Yeah, where you should participate. Where you should participate. So, and I, what I just said, just suppose it on your own industry or wherever your calling is. Another thing, maybe I just add one more thing to it. Platforms, platforms, platforms. Whatever God has called you to do, I beg of you, think of a platform to pioneer it. This generation is a platform generation. Yeah. What platforms can I use or leverage to pioneer what God has put in my hands? This last decade has raised many people that are called influencers because they jump on specific platforms, digital platforms, all kinds of platforms. I was teaching at this present house last Sunday, and um, I just was thinking, and the Holy Spirit gave me an inspiration. I think I, I spoke at the two services, the second service at this present house last Sunday. When I got on the stage, I told the media, I said, put up uh, uh, the YouTube page of Mr. Beast. How many people here know Mr. Beast? Uh -huh. You people are more in tune. The people <laughs> I was speaking to last Sunday, some of them are just hearing Mr. Beast for the first time. Yeah. 
that's perhaps the guy that has maybe the highest number of subscribers on YouTube, or maybe second to the highest or something. Over 200 million mm. subscribers on YouTube. I'm not saying 2 million, 200. You know, our own influencers here, they have 1 million, 2 million. Mr. Beast has over 200 million subscribers on YouTube. And all is leveraging is a principle. That's a principle of seed and space. Mm. Seed and platform. Most of his posts, they are all about something philanthropic or a way of dashing somebody something. Is that dashing somebody a house, dashing people $200,000, dashing people this and that. So people rush in there, but it's leveraging YouTube like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And his work is global. If it was back in the day, Mr. Beast will be on ABC or Fox in America, and it's only Americans that will know him. Yes, sir. Yeah. But with YouTube, what he's doing is global. And with that kind of following and heat on YouTube, YouTube has no choice. They have to budget for Mr. Beast. Yeah. Him, only him. I'm sure what they are paying him is almost like in millions of dollars on a weekly basis. Now, if you don't study people like that, you won't think of thinking out of the box. Mm. You will only still be thinking of either traditional ways of making money or crooked ways of making money. When people are making clean money by just looking at different possibilities and things that have changed and exploring platforms that are new or that are emerging, you know? So, um, if you leave me, I'll just keep talking. Yes? <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> but you, you have a second question. Yes, sir, about the giants in about the land. About the giants in the land. I said some of these giants are human beings, like parents, you know, and all that. Yes. It's still the same principle. Joshua and Caleb said, the giants will not stop us. Said, let no man have, if, the same thing that David said, in 1 Samuel 17, in that same value, he said, let no man's heart be troubled because of this Goliath. Mm. Yeah. You know the first thing? Don't be troubled. Mm. Yeah. Refuse to be troubled. Yeah. Whether it's a relationship that is very pivotal, or whether it's your parents, whether it's somebody, whoever may be a giant trying to hinder you from getting into your promised land, the first attitude is I refuse to be troubled. Because when you embrace the peace of God, what will happen is that God will start to show you a way around it. That's a way to get into your promised land. Yeah. And what you put on the table is a big one. Because if your parents are the ones standing on your way, they are not Goliath. You can't kill them. All right? Yes, sir. Have we all agreed? Yes, sir. That nobody will commit murder here? Yes, sir. Say amen, everybody. Amen. Uh -huh. But you still have to find your way around it. And that takes me to a leadership and life principle that says in life there are problems to solve and tensions to manage. You have to find the difference between the two. Not everything in life is a problem to solve. I tell people, you know, at the Elevation Church when I'm teaching, for married people, for instance, your mother-in-law is not a problem to solve. <laughs> if not, you'll be tempted to poison her. Yeah. It's a tension to manage, lest you commit murder. So in life, not everything is a problem to solve. Some things are tensions to manage. Your sibling, notwithstanding how cantacurus or troublesome they are, they are not a problem to solve. It's a tension to manage. You have to live with them. Sometimes they will bring the best out of you. Sometimes they will bring the worst out of you. But you cannot exterminate them. You can't, some people think they can solve the problem by just cutting off. You know? Going to seclusion. Live on your own. Cut off family. Cut off everybody. All your friends cannot be a problem to solve. So you now cut off from all of them. You are the problem. You are the problem. Some of them are just tensions to manage. 
Yeah. You can't ditch all your childhood friends. Life doesn't work like that. Are you hearing me, somebody? Yes, sir. Life doesn't work like that. You have to take some of them as tensions to manage. You know that this person cannot keep secret. So keep secret away from them. Yeah. But you can still be friends. It's just that their secrets you will not expose in that place because they have not received grace to keep secret. Mm. And until God gives them that grace, don't destroy your life by putting all your secret there sure. because you'll find it on the blogs. Yeah. You'll find it somewhere you don't want to find it. So you have to be careful. So when you, when you meet unreasonable people, dangerous people, you gain wisdom. You gain wisdom. Lest you become a murderer. Because temptation to kill people <laughs> will become pervasive in your heart. There are tensions to manage, there are problems to solve. You have to be able to separate the two. So in dealing with this Goliath situation, you also have to know the difference between the two. Awesome. Please let's put our hands together. I think. So just to mention very quickly that we have the opportunity for you to send in questions. I'm going to, I know we we're pressed for time, but I'm going to see how many of those we can take. Um, so please, if you, could, if you don't mind, just send your questions to the number that's scrolling on the top of the screen. Um, and I'm going to quickly jump on this third question before we take questions from the room. Also to mention to our online audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box. We'd be very happy to take those as well. We always prioritize our online audience. So, so you've been talking about adaptability, and that is where I want to jump up. So Israel came and gave his God experience. I was talking about how, oh, you know, I shot a movie, house rent, I used to make movie, blah, blah, blah. But he was not married that year. He could use his house rent for, for movie making. But now we are in this age where, Adrian, what do you say? I can't. You can't, your wife will tackle you. Let us know, I know your wife. Anyways, but now we're in this age where everyone craves stability. So I'm trying to pioneer, I'm trying to push the envelope, but then my babe is telling me that, you know, uh, will you not take me on holiday? Will you not, join? like, they're asking you questions and they're saying, you know, what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? Like, they want to know that, you can provide that stability for them. So how do I balance that? How do I navigate this tension where I'm trying to push the envelope, but I also need to be able to sort of take care of my bills, you know, go and watch a movie, do all the things that are expected of people of, you know, a responsible person in, in this day and age? Now that's a very good question, but I'll answer it this way. Um, there's a tendency to only live today or live for today. And when you are in a dating relationship and your partner is the kind of person that only lives today or lives for today, you need to be able to help them to change their attitude or maybe that relationship is not meant for you if you're going to live on the pioneering spirit. Let me explain what I mean. People who live for today they only take care of today. They don't take care of tomorrow. So you see daily wage workers who work today and collect 10K today and finish it by 7 p.m. because they feel tomorrow is another day. Yeah. And the assumption is that I will have enough strength to go to the construction site tomorrow and I will do another work. They will give me another money and I will blow it. You know? So that's what it means to live today and live for today. Yeah. It's good to live today. Enjoy the goodness of today, but don't live for today. Live today, but don't live for today. So, you may need money to go on a date. That's how to live today. We need to have dates. Yeah. So that this date will not be outdated. We have to be dating. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but, we can't spend all our money there. It means that we are living today, but we are living for today. Mm. Live today, but don't live for today. Live for tomorrow. Yeah. And every young person must understand that con concept. That's the only thing that makes you to leave something behind. And to be able to take risk today that has a promise of a better tomorrow. So, please, can I just push back a little bit? Yeah. Because we talked about this, the aspire to perspire to Maguire whole thing. If I go and meet a babe now and I tell her that, um, so babe, um, I would like for us to live today, but I'm living for tomorrow. 
you know, and so what that means is, for instance, rather than go to La Brioche, how about La Chicken Republic? Do you understand? Since we're living today, and the point I'm making is, the, it takes a lot to be able to sell that vision to somebody. So, um, how, do, how, thank God, this is not a problem for some of us, Ijiro, but how do we, how do we do this, sir? How do we explain that we are living for tomorrow? Yeah, I, I get you. It's a tough one, but you know, I also need you to understand that you are dealing with something real. There's a spirit of the age. Mm. Just like there are projects for a generation, there are generational voices that are also the demons of every generation. Mm. Yeah. Can I show you the demons of your generation? Yes, sir, please. Well, show them, sir. Okay. <laughs> Put Romans 1 and verse 30 on the screen. It describes a little bit of the demons of this generation. Romans 1 and verse 30. If you can, put it on the screen. Uh, I, I would. Or you can read it for me in New Living Translation. Okay. That's NKJV. That's NKJV. New Living Translation, if you can. Because the a particular thing. Okay. It says they are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud. We? Wait first. <laughs> Boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. At least all of you agree with me that this generation has a knack for inventing new ways of sinning. <laughs> Am I saying the truth? Yes. <laughs> God bless you for agreeing with me. We may not be able to, you know, debate the other things there, but that one, they invent new ways of sinning, and maybe also they disobey parents. It's, it's part of the spirit of the age. You understand? But things like backstabber, hater, insolent, is, is also, is proud, it? boastful. See that proud and boastful? It's part of it. Yeah. Because the average... Lagos big girl or big boy is proud and boastful. Amen. That's why it's difficult for you to sell to them that let's go to Chicken Republic. We're not marketing Chicken Republic, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know we say we'll shake tables. Please, you people should not be holding those tables too tight. Let's shake it. Yes, sir. There are some things that should not be difficult to explain. Yeah. I have my friend here, uh, uh, Mr. Israel Ojo. He lives in the US. He's visiting and he came in with me. I know a bit of his story. He's, uh, he's an astute entrepreneur, managing a big business you know, in the state of Maryland in the US. I was visiting with him like two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I knew how he entered the US. I knew the role his wife played. You know to help him to settle in. And I, I, don't, I, I can't remember all the story, but what I knew was that when we are cracking jokes, is why we'll be saying, uh, if that I help your destiny, you know, <laughs> and all that. <laughs> but today, he pays all the bills. Mm. God has blessed him. And, but his wife worked with him the way he was then. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Last night, I was at an event one of our young people at Elevation Church, I think the guy is just about maybe in his late 30s or maybe he's just turning 40, he's into real estate. He was celebrating the fifth anniversary of his company right there at the Civic Center. Last night I was there, just briefly. But I listened to him as he was wrapping up. Um, the project that he's embarking on right now, and he's still... And he was saying, this is a testament to the pioneering grace upon our church. My pastor is here. That's what he was saying. A thousand units of housing in the suburb of Lagos here. And he said, in the next five years, this is going to happen. It's like a, a city. A thousand units with school, with hospital, with everything within it. And they have started. He said they are on house number 46. But he said it's a five-year project. But you know, this company started two years before COVID. Please remember, five years ago. 
he said, he said, my last salary in paid employment was 46,500 naira. Yeah. He said, when he got that alert, that his last month at work, he just told himself, I'm bigger than this. I can do better than this. He had a small car. Maybe his parents helped him. I didn't even know how he got a car from 46K. <laughs> yeah. So he said he went back home and told his wife that he's starting a business in real estate. He was married on 46K. <laughs> yeah. So he told his wife he was starting a business. I mean, he made all of us to stand up, give his wife a standing ovation. Mm. He said there is some measure of foolishness that is needed for you to follow your dream. He said, this woman chose to be foolish to follow me. This is where we are today. There are 40 employees right now in that business. 40 people work for them. Yeah. So imagine his wife saying, uh, you are stupid. Uh, as somebody's trying to cope with you with 46 k You don't say you are leaving your work. You know, uh, you want to kill me. You know, I can't be a part of this madness. They won't be here today. Mm. So I'm just saying that we need to be able to discuss those things. Love is not a feeling. It's a commitment. Mm. It's more than a feeling. So if you just want to feel love by going to big restaurants, what about the commitment of the actuality of where we are? that we need to leverage to get to where we are going. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Anybody that you are dating, that you cannot put lady cards on the table and say, this is where things are, this is where we, what we can do now, and all that. You are not dating, oh. Yeah, you are not dating. Somebody is leading you to the slaughter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's not dating. That is something that can, <laughs> that can derail your destiny. Open communication is one of the major foundations of a dating relationship. I should not present myself as having what I don't have. What I don't have today, I will have tomorrow. If you don't believe in my tomorrow, why are you wasting your time around me today? Yeah. And if you use your, my today to judge my tomorrow, you are not, you are not supposed to be around me. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'm going to ask if there are any questions from our online audience. I want to also give uh, PG a few more minutes to just pray, because like we mentioned, the opportunity is here for him as a father to open up those doors in our hearts. Um, so I, I know I've received one question, but I'm going to tackle that later. Is there any, any other question? Tulu? In the online audience? Okay. Okay. All right. Let me just take one more, sir. A uh, quick fire question. And then I will take that last question. So we were talking about um, stepping into this pioneering spirit. And one of the things you had mentioned was how, you know, Caleb and Joshua were able to go with that mindset to, you know, give us this, give us this place. Um, we're able to take it. And I want to just talk about the role of mentors in that because it takes a Moses to be able to say to them, okay, you guys go ahead and go and scout this new territory. And for a lot of us in this day and age, we're struggling, or some people are struggling to sort of find good mentors who have that ability to be able to see that there is a new, you know, vista on the horizon and, and then direct your thought process towards that. Um, especially because we, obviously, we live in this day and age where everybody has access to everyone. You know, you go on LinkedIn. I was talking to a mentor the other day, and he was talking about how on LinkedIn he's getting 60, 70 messages a week from people who are reaching out to him for mentorship in different capacities. Some people just say, hello, sir, please be my mentor. Other people write a full-on essay, you know, stating all the things they've gone through in life and why they... But the point I'm making is, how do we access the right kind of mentorship that leads us to start to think and see what these new opportunities are? You're touching something very important, and that's the place of enabling relationships in your pioneering journey. Pioneers have been known to engage enabling relationships. Um, is it a Timothy, the young pastor in the Bible? The enabling relationship happened to be uh, 
the, the Apostle Paul, who challenged him and told him, let no man despise your youth. Be an example of a believer. I'm talking to a 21-year-old Pastor Tim. Yeah. And that's what we read in the Bible today. We call it the book of Timothy. So everybody needs a mentor, needs a coach. Everybody needs a gatekeeper, somebody who can open networks and resources to you. Sometimes it looks like something far-fetched. Some other times it's not like that. Platforms today have opened up things to us. It's just that a lot of people feel they need personal contact or recognition or face-to-face -face before somebody can mentor you. There are people that have mentored me I've never met before. All I've done is just to read all their books. I have great mentors in ministry. The first time we were in this location as Elevation Church in 2013 or so, where well, the late Dr. Miles Monroe visited our church for the first time. I've been reading his book since I was in high school. Yeah. And I'd followed him, his teachings on potentials, his teachings on leadership, you know, his teachings on vision. All his books, my, I mean, I even left some of his books here in my, that you people have in your library now. You carried my book. God bless you. <laughs> The pastor took it on your behalf. You know, left some of my books in my old office here. They're now part of Life Point Library. You can follow people from afar. Hmm. If you need to meet them physically, God will create the opportunity. Yeah. It was just after a midweek service here, when the Elevation Church was still here, I think 2012, that a lady walked up to me and said, PG, would you want Dr. Mars Munro to preach in our church? I said, are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say it like that, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, I know PG is true. Da, 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 da. And that, that, that was where it started from. And then he connected me with a person who was bringing Dr. Miles to Nigeria. And the person said, oh, why not? You know, we've been hearing about you. Great, great work. I know it's a new church, but, and that was it. And Dr. Miles came here. I was like, oh, my son, I love what you're doing. Da, da, da. And then the second time, and I think like a third time, he came like three times, you know, before he passed on. So you can imagine what I'm saying. And that was the man that lives in the Bahamas. Same thing with Brand Tracy. I don't know how many people here know Brand Tracy and you've read any of his book. Great American motivational speaker and all that. Management, you know, writer, wrote many books. Yeah, I've read his books. Eat that frog. Uh, you know, uh, 100 Laws of Business Success, Brand Tracy. All kinds of books that I've read. I've taught from his books. And it just so happened like that too. I never knew I was going to be able to meet him. And somebody just said, well, bring Brand Tracy to Nigeria. I want him to speak in your church. And then, hey, bring it on. <laughs> yeah. And from there, I met with Brand Tracy. We took him on a on, on uh, dinner and we became friends. And he came again. <laughs> so I'm just saying as you pursue your dreams, locate mentors. Don't force yourself on them. Yeah. If somebody approached me today and say, I want you to mentor me in leadership or in ministry or in this, one of the questions I love to ask is, have you read any of my books? Mm. Do you listen to my podcast? So where should I start with you? With all the resources I've pushed out, I should now go back to so 1985, and start with you from there. Why? Mm. But I, I will be more delighted, <laughs> you know, if I can hear you say, oh, I remember <laughs> a couple of years ago uh, meeting Dr. David Eredepo, and, uh, you know, he warming up to me and all that, and, and what I told him, that in 1995, I was at your Bible school in Wolfby. The whole atmosphere changed. Mm. You understand? I mean, this person has been, in his mind, I mean, he was able to reason, this guy has been following me for close to 30 years to be able to come to Bible school in 95. Yeah. So you get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. You, you said somebody wants to mentor, this person is doing the seminar, you can't show up. You can't pay and show up. Yeah. The person has, you want somebody to mentor, you admire, you are in legal profession, you admire this legal luminary. They don't have to invite you to where they are speaking. If you see 
an Instagram post that says there's an inaugural lecture or something, and uh, this so so and so person, SAN, is speaking there. Just go and sit at the back and listen. Follow them on social media. Make comment on their post. After a while, they are the ones that will be saying, "Who is this guy who is always commenting on my post?" Mm. They can even send somebody to go and look for you, especially if your post is always making sense. <laughs> Don't just post flames, fire, 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 fire. <laughs> Yeah, they're the ones that will go and look, say, look for you and bring you closer. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, but most people want to reap where they have not sown anything. Mm. And it, it, there's a show of commitment. That's part of your seed. A show of followership. That's part of your seed. So, before you write to somebody on LinkedIn, follow them closely. Yeah, follow them closely. You don't need people to be physically in your life before they can mentor you. Today, we still read the Bible. And we read about David. As a man after God's heart, we read the book of Psalms, or the Psalms of David. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. As you read it, David is mentoring you because you wrote that Psalm hmm. yeah, as a song. And now you read it, you receive encouragement. So there are many mentors out there. You just need to choose who you are following. The only problem with this generation Eh? again, let's check the table, is they say they are looking for great mentors and all that. When you see the people they are following on Instagram and Twitter, you see Lady Gaga, and it's not your mentor. Is he your mentor? No. But that's the person you are following. I'm not saying don't follow anybody you want to follow, but the people you really want to mentor you, mm. you're not even following them. You don't, I mean, you listen to podcasts, people who are ranting and cracking jokes, so I feel like there's a specific podcast. <laughs> I don't want to cause any trouble. But there are podcasts that people who are going far in destiny must not be listening to. Yeah. Because some, <laughs> some of those podcasts can derail your destiny. Yeah. Because they put wrong seed. Wrong, wrong seed. seed. Yeah. Virus that will jam your system. Yes, sir. Yeah. And when the virus has damned your system, even when you come to church, everything we're saying is over the bar, over the bar. Yeah. Because there's a virus that has corrupted your operating system. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah. So be careful. Curate the people that you follow. Just put a list. I tell them in our church, and I'm saying it here again now. If you don't follow me, I'm not your pastor. Yeah. My sheep hear my voice. Yes, sir. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yeah. And they follow me. And yes, they follow sir. me. That's what Jesus said. If Jesus was this generation, wouldn't you follow him <laughs> on social media? Because then my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, is the people that you are following, you are watching every day, mm. that's putting seed in you. That's why the real people you are following, those are the people mentoring you. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Yeah. I don't discount uh, um, entertainment and fun, but take it in moderation. You can follow somebody for entertainment factor. Take it in moderation. But if the people that will contribute the most to your life, who are making sense in what you want to do, you're not following them. They're just playing. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, again, again, I apologize. I know we're pressed for time, but the questions have flooded in. And I want to just quickly address these in, say, a minute or two, just specific to some of the people who are asking. Um, so if I have stepped out or, I, you know, I started a relationship with a mentor on the wrong foot, again, just, do I just keep following from a distance? Is there anything specific that you might want to instruct uh, for someone who started a mentorship relationship but on the wrong foot with that mentor? I think you should slow down. Yeah. Slow down. Uh, take it a day at a time. Anything, any relationship can be reworked, even if it started on the wrong footing. Every mentor is looking for people who can carry his or her legacy. Mm. The moment you start doing something important with your life, even people will seek after you. Yeah. People will seek after you. Great mentors want prodigies that have capacity to carry their legacy. 
if you are seen as one of such, they will still come back to you. Even if, there are people I tried to relate with many years ago, but I would, I mean, there was no opportunity or anything like that. But as you maximize what you have, then other doors will start to open. People will seek after you. I mean, I was sharing in church earlier today how late last year I got a call uh, from a friend of mine from the U.S. who was telling me, oh, uh, Pastor So-and-so would like to speak to you. And that's the pastor of a mega church in the state of Texas, big, you know, a global guy. He said he wants to speak to me. I said, okay, no problem. And the guy was like, look, somebody spoke to me about you, and I, I just took my time to check what you're doing. Uh, we recommended you to be a part of a network. Uh, it's a network of, you know, uh, what you can call a government, governmental churches around the world. And most of them are the biggest churches in their country, from the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, you know, the likes of Hillsong. Yeah, Pastor Phil Dooley, you saw me take a picture with him earlier this year, who took over from Brown Houston. We're in that network together. Phil Dooley is someone I wanted to connect with, even when he was pastor of Hillsong, South Africa. Now it's a global pastor of Hillsong. Just somebody seeing what we're doing here, put me in a network where Phil Dooley and I can sit as colleagues around the table and be discussing. So those people that you are even looking out for now that you want to be your mentor, very soon they will give you the right of passage to sit around the table with them, almost mm. as colleagues. Mm. Because the small mentoring you are getting from afar has produced enough fruit they can now see that if they invest more in you, you take it to the next level. So what are you doing with the small that you have received? I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then last one, um, someone is talking about pioneering and being spread too thin. You know, I'm chasing so many new ideas that I don't necessarily know how to manage my energy levels because I'm trying to do this, trying to do that, all these new ideas. So you can just talking about it, because I know you spoke about it, moderation. How do I integrate moderation into my desire to break frontiers? I'd like to say that not every battle is your battle. Not every opportunity is your opportunity. In life, it's better we focus on one or two things that we can do well and we can pour ourselves into. To the end that when something is mentioned and 10 people are going to comment or an area or a field of endeavor is mentioned, seven out of 10 should mention your name as an authority in that place. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yes. It's a better way to extend yourself than to just be jack of all trade and master of none. So, where are the two places? Max, three. Best, two. Sometimes even one that you really want to pour yourself, especially at a season in your life. Yeah, because your journey of pioneering is progressive. We can always pioneer again in a different way. But wherever God has led you to pioneer part time, you need to pour yourself into it to the point that you will make a mark that cannot be erased. That's the best way to build a legacy. But to do touch and go, here today, go tomorrow, here today, go tomorrow, you, 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 your mark can be easily erased, you know. And I know that a lot of us are young people who are still trying to figure out life. But I tell you the truth, the earlier you figure things out and make a commitment to pour yourself into something, into an area, the better for you. Yeah, the better for you. It, it, it's, it just gives you the opportunity of what is called com compound interest. We all know compound interest. Yes. Yeah. You put it there, you keep it there, it builds up with time. The concept of compound interest works in career, it works in business focus, 
it works in every area of life. Just the same way you can put a million naira away today and 15 years from now, it can be anything, especially if you invest it at a fixed rate and it's compounding over the years and you don't touch it. The same thing when you're putting your effort, you know, on something. You know, there's, if you have read uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, that's the title of the book, Outliers. If you haven't read it, please lay your hands on it and read it. Malcolm Gladwell. The title of the book is Outliers. In Outliers, Gladwell described a concept that he called 10,000 hour rule. That if you invest 10,000 hours in any area of endeavor that research has proven without a shadow of doubt that you're going to rise to become top 3% or so, or top 2% in that industry. If you, the only issue is that it takes years to invest 10,000 hours. I mean, it described people like Bill Gates in that chapter of that book, how Bill Gates, you know, the way coding was done in Bill Gates' days, it was the, with this paper thing and a uh, ticker tape and, uh, and how Bill Gates would go to the University of Michigan, which was a stone's throw from his parents' house, and even manipulate the entry code and will be coding all night, compounding the number of hours. You know, he didn't know that that was what he was doing. But he capacitated himself to the point where the world doesn't, didn't have a choice but to hear him. I don't know if you're getting what I'm yes, saying. Sir. Yeah. The popular music band in the U.S. called the Beatles, it described how the band members will be snowed in. Maybe they are on a tour, but they are snowed in. They cannot perform, but they will carry their instrument with them. In that place where they are snowed in, they are rehearsing and playing and compounding the 10,000 hours. I mean, you know that a generational phenomenon. You can't talk music in the U.S., uh, not talk about the Beatles or Elvis Presley, all those kind of people. Compound 10,000 hours. But you can imagine if you put 200 hours here and you then leave, and you go and start afresh. Another three, 500 hours, and then you leave, and then you go somewhere else. It won't add up. It won't compound. Are you hearing me right now? Yes, sir. Yeah. I need you to think about it. In the next 10 years, what can I pour myself into that I can say I've invested my 10,000 hours? This world will be left with no choice than to give me the right of passage to gravitate to the top 1 or 2% in that industry. It has worked without fail. Ladies and gentlemen, success is not a mystery. It's not a mystery. Don't make it mysterious. Yeah. You can literally walk your way to the top with the help of God. And by engaging a pioneering spirit. With a heart of commitment and courage. And investing your life in the right direction. Success is not a mystery. Yeah. Success is not a mystery. And it is possible for everyone. Again, I encourage you to read books like Outliers, put it side by side with your Bible. You will understand life better. Because in, in, in that book again, Michael Gladwell only just extrayed a few people who seemed like outliers and demystified them. <laughs> Not in a bad way, but in a way that shows you that you can do what they did. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You can do what they did. They're not outliers, essentially. Yeah. You can do what they did because success is not a mystery. The Bible says the race is not to the swift. The battle is not only to the strong. It says time and chance happen to them all. One translation says being at the right place at the right time. I pray for somebody here today <laughs> that my God will start to order your steps to be at the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right things 
in the name of Jesus. Your destiny will not be wasted. In the name of Jesus. Confusion shall be far from you. Distraction shall be far from you. Whatever makes young people waste the early years of their lives will be far from you. Your youthful years will not be wasted. In the name of Jesus, I pray for wisdom for you to maximize your youthful years. Receive grace to build the right foundation for your life. Receive grace to build the right foundation for your future. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the heavens open over you. May God Open the heavens over you. May he make his face shine upon you. May the grace of God be released upon you afresh. May his favor come upon your labor. You will no longer labor in vain in the name of Jesus. And anyone under the influence of my voice who may be dealing with an issue that is bigger than you, I pray for you today that God will roll the mountains away. In the name of Jesus. Rise on your feet, everybody. Rise on your feet, everybody. Let's wrap this up in prayers. I want to speak a blessing over you. Glory to Jesus. Lift your two hands to Jesus. Lift your two hands to Jesus. And I want you to just... Just surrender it all to Him afresh. And I surrender to you everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. I surrender. I surrender. Give you all of me. Somebody, will you surrender your future to the hands of God right now? I give you my future. I give you my today and I give you my future. I give you my today and I give you my future. I'm holding back nothing. I'm holding back nothing. I'm holding back nothing. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. Somebody, can you put your career in his hand right now? I, I give you my career. 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 Lord, have your way. Have your way in my career. Somebody, will you surrender your sexuality to him right now? I say, Lord, I just put your, my sexuality into your hand right now. I give you my sexuality. I give you my sexual life. I, I, I put it in your hand. I put it in your hand. I put it in your hand. When we say we're told in nothing, we mean it. We mean it. We mean it. You can put everything in the hands of God. 
He can put everything in His hand. Somebody release your emotional life to God. Release your emotions to God. Release your emotions to God. Let God touch your emotions. Let your touch your emotional life. This up and down emotionally must come to an end. Don't surrender your emotions to drugs. Don't surrender your emotions to substances. Put it in the hand of God. It's a better regulator. It's a better regulator. It can help you to be sound emotionally. God can help you to unravel complex things that may be messing up your mind. God can help you to unravel things messing up your emotions. Will you put it in his hand right now? I wanted to make it a, a, a personal prayer. I say, Lord, just take my emotions. Somebody who's been nursing an emotional pain, will you put it in the hands of God? I release it to you today. Heal my emotions. Heal my emotions. Heal my emotions. Somebody, you have been mismanaging managing your sexuality. Why don't you put it in his hand right now? He can help you manage it. He can help you manage it. He can help you manage it. Put it in his hand. I give you all of me, Jesus. I give you all of me, Jesus. I give you all of me, Jesus. Put your finances in his hands. And just say, Lord, have your way in my finances. Lord, have your way in my finances. Lord, have your way in my finances. Somebody, will you put your skill in God's hand? That talent, that thing that has refused to produce, put it in God's hand. Whatever God touches becomes fruitful. Yeah. Put it in God's hand. Put it in God's hand. God can open up new platforms for your skill. New platforms for your talent. New platforms. Lord, we put it in your hand and we ask that you open new platforms. We put our sexuality in your hand. We ask for healing. Healing. Help us to be better stewards of our sexuality. Heal, heal, set free and deliver. Jesus, son of the living God, will give you permission to move over your, your sons and daughters here. Touch someone emotionally right now. Touch someone emotionally right now. Let your strength overshadow somebody's weakness. Let chains be broken right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you, our Father. We honor you, our Father. We honor you, our Father. Wave those hands to him and just bless him. Father, we thank you. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says there's no other name that is given amongst men by which men may be saved but the name of Jesus. Somebody, you may not have been able to put a word to it, but you know there's a gap. Something is missing. And it's making you miserable. You have not been able to put a word to describe it, but something is missing. There's a missing link. I just want you to know that Jesus is the missing link. And I'm not saying that because that's what pastors will say or religious people will say. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. He's saying, I can fix your frustrations. I can fix your frustrations. Even things that you don't have a word to qualify, I can fix them. I can fix them. He's the ultimate fixer. He wants to fix you emotionally, fix you mentally, fix you physically. I want to give you one more minute to so just lift your hands to him. And say, Jesus, give me an encounter this season. Give me an encounter this season. Is there an area of life where you need an encounter? I wanted to talk to him about it right now. Somebody needs to walk out of something. That's an area of life where you need an encounter. 
And I want you to talk to God about it right now. Just talk to God about it right now. Waymaker, miracle walk, promise key, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that song and then speak to God. Just sing it song. Somebody ask him for an encounter. In that area. Ask him for an encounter. He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. Our God has integrity. That is who you are. That's who he is. Ask him for an encounter. Say, Lord, touch me. Touch me in this area. Touch my heart. Touch my mind. Touch my career. Two prayers very quickly. One is for somebody who has been overwhelmed by life. So overwhelmed. I remember I was speaking to someone in the intermission between first and second service at the Lucky Center today. A lady who told me, said PG, last month I had a meltdown. So tell me about it, what happened? said I was driving, I was going to work, I was so overwhelmed, I was writing an exam, I was going to work, my sister's kids, three of them are in my house, so many things were happening around me, said all of a sudden, I was gasping for breath as I was driving, said I stopped in the middle of the road, I was only able to manage the car to the side of the road, and I cried my heart out said I had to leave work for a few days I'm a lot better now I laid my hands on her and prayed for her sometimes life becomes very overwhelming your case may not be like that of that lady but you don't want it to get there that's why God sent me to you today I want to pray for you I want to pray for you there's a strength that comes just comes into your inner man you're able to pull through complex situations and still strong yeah Paul writes in the book of Ephesians said that you may be strengthened with might in your inner man strengthened with might in your inner man strengthened with might in your inner man the Bible says if you feel the day of adversity it's because your strength is small it's not because of the adversity. It's because your strength is small. Somebody who has been crashing, crashing, crashing under heavy weight, emotional weight, career weight, relationship weight, financial pressure. If you feel the day of adversity, it's not because of the issue. It's because your strength is small. I love to pray for somebody here today that the strength of the Most High will overshadow you. I also want to pray for people who need healing. I saw in a flash someone who, uh, and I'm talking about a lady now, it's a gynecological issue, like a discharge. God is healing it right now as I speak. Yeah. 
when I saw it in the flash, I didn't want to talk about it because I felt I don't want to talk about things like that. But the Holy Spirit told me, are you the healer? Why are you feeling somehow about this? And I, I don't know who you are, but God, 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 God is healing you right now. God is healing you right now. God is healing you right now. I speak to the life of a lady here. Your life has been covered with a lot of shame and shameful things. God said, I'm wiping away shame from your life. Yeah. Wiping away shame for you, from your life. I don't know what brings you to that place of feeling ashamed of yourself all the time. But God said, I'm wiping away shame for your life from your life. He said, I, 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 I will bring you to the place of exchange. I give you beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaviness. Glory be to Jesus. And God is healing all kinds of sicknesses here. So I'm just going to pray all together. I'm praying for that person that God has healed of that discharge. It will never come again. I'm praying for that person. Shame has gone out of your life praying for that person who needs strength in your inner man. Lift your hand to Jesus right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak as I've been commanded here today, right now. Anyone on the verge of a meltdown today as the one that has authority in the spirit, I avert every meltdown in the name of Jesus. Satan, I command you to lose your hold over their mind. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I receive strength for you in your inner man. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. you will no longer cave in. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I receive grace upon you to survive pregnancy. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, receive strength in your inner man. Receive strength in your inner man. Receive strength in your inner man. In the name of Jesus, I pray for that person without physical gynecological issue I decree by the power in the blood of Jesus that your healing comes now in the name of Jesus so you are healed now you are healed now in the name of Jesus I receive that same power of healing over someone here with a migraine headache that comes periodically I decree in the name of Jesus you're not coming back. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I decree your healing now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. So I pray for diverse healings to take place here right now. Amen. Holy Spirit, touch their bodies. Touch their mind. Touch their emotions. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray again for that person. Shame is wiped away from you. Amen. Receive your emotional healing right now. Amen. When you want to feel that shame, you will not be able to feel it again. Amen. That shame disappears from your life. Amen. God is going to confirm it this week. Amen. Because you are going to step out and step up into a situation that you dread. Something that makes you feel inadequate. The capacity of Jehovah is coming upon you right now. When you step out, you will not be able to feel shame. Amen. My God, strengthening your heart, pushing you to your next level. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. may the pioneering grace over this house rest upon you. Amen. May grace come upon you for enabling relationships. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. your teachers, mentors, and coaches will no longer be hidden from you. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. step into a season of divine connection where God will connect you with the right mentors, right coaches, right gatekeepers, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. And we bless your holy name. Wave those hands to him and just bless him. Bless him all over this place. Bless him all over this place. Bless him all over this place. One last prayer. One last prayer. One last prayer. Say, with, say, say an answer of prayer with heads bowed. Can I pray for anyone under the influence of this service or anyone online who may be saying, PG, I'm really far away from God. I'm cut off from God. I know God is here. I cannot lie. 
I'm not born again. Somebody was saying, I, I gave my life to Christ before I said a prayer, but I backslid into sin. And sin has cut me off from God. I want to reconnect with God. I want to reconnect with God. I want to reconnect with God. Can I have the pleasure of praying with you today? Because God also wants to reconnect with you. Jesus is looking for you. And he's knocking at the door of your heart right now. He wants to do something new in your life. If you're right under the influence of my voice, can I ask that you put your hand on your heart and let me pray with you. Just put your hand on your heart. Your heart is the center of your being. Just put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. If you are online, I want you to go to the chat or comment and let us know. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm giving my life to Jesus. If your hand is on your heart, can you lift the second one up as a sign of your surrender to Jesus? And I'm going to pray for you right now. Just lift the second one up as a sign of your surrender to Jesus. And I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. God will start something new in your life. You'll never be the same again. Thank you. Thank you for lifting up your hand. Just lift it up. Lift it up to Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. No man can save another. No pastor can save another. Jesus is the Savior. And the Savior is here. The Savior is here. The Savior is here. For everyone lifting up your hand, whether you're in this room or you're online, I want you to say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today, I open up myself to you. I give you all of me. I ask that you forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from every unrighteousness. I need you as my savior. I invite you into my life. Be my Lord. Be my savior. I yield my life to you totally and completely. Take control. Take charge from this moment forward. I open my heart to you. Fill it with your spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Take control. Take charge. And guide me into my destiny. Say, I declare that I'm now born again. I'm a child of God. I will love Jesus. I will serve Jesus the remaining days of my life. Thank you, Father, for accepting me just the way I am. If you just said a prayer with me, a card has been given to you. Um, if you just feel the card, yeah, please feel the card. Our, our ministers will approach you, uh, either to talk to you or to collect a card from you or something. And if the ministers want to take them out, it's all okay. If not, just feel the card and make sure you give it back to them after now. And please make yourself available for any of our faith development efforts that can help you uh, to build your faith so that you will not have to, you know, to fall back again because God is interested in working with you and working you into your destiny. Can we put our hands together and celebrate all the bold people who made a decision for Jesus today? Hallelujah.